Any object flying over the Earth can be represented by its latitude, longitude, and altitude. Given two locations, the starting point of a rocket and its landing site, the objective is to design a smooth flight path which connects the two points. Learn how to build a GUI application which takes in custom user inputs for the starting location and the landing location of a rocket and designs a smooth trajectory which connects the two locations. Let's start. Okay, so this presentation will go over all the concepts and I will explain to you how we will set up our problem. So the inputs by the user will be the landing point, which is the latitude and the longitude. We assume that it is at zero altitude. Next will be the storing location, where you will input the latitude, the longitude, and the altitude as well. The first thing you have to do is find this angle here, which is the line of sight angle. Now you do this because you want the rocket to start as high as possible. So that means that you want this angle to be a high value, ideally above 60 degrees, although the more you go, the better it is. So you want to set the start location as high as you can. If it is lower, then you won't get a feasible trajectory. I've set this limit here. You can either increase this height here, or you can also move in the landing point a bit. You can reduce the distance between the start and the landing point, this value D here. You can also find the bearing angle from the Haver sign formula. So we have this value of D, which is the distance between the start and the end point, the great circle distance, ignoring the altitude. So it'll be the straight line distance here. Next, you can also find this value of A. So this A is the user input, which is the altitude itself. And then by doing arc tan A over D, you get the line of sight angle. Since it should be a high value, more than 60 degrees, you want the value of A to be much larger than the value of D, right? From like obvious geometry. The sigmoid curve is used in business operations like operations research, machine learning as well. It's quite a famous curve and we will be doing our trajectory by representing this curve. So on the left here, you have the default curve. It goes from zero to one where it is tangent at the edges. In this case, X is from minus six to six. And the curve is given by one divided by one plus E to the power of minus X. So as you go below minus six and above six here, the curve will just remain at zero and one. It'll be tangent uh, as you can see here. But we want to modify this curve, right? Because our curve will go from the downrange distance here, and then this should be the height. If you see here, I flipped the XY curve. So if you think about it, this is the rocket descending this way, right? And it is moving along this path here. So this is the height. So Y is from zero to A in this example. X will be the downrange distance, right? From zero to D. So you want the curve to follow this trajectory here. So that's what we are looking for. So how can we achieve this? What I did was I did a bunch of experiments and I found the best way to do it. This will be our curve before rotation. So this, this curve here on this XY plot will be this one. So the first thing you can see is the value is scaled up from zero to one to zero to D, right? So all you have to do for that is multiply this whole thing by D, which I did here. And then you want to modify this line. And I did that by changing the division factor here. So one thing you can do to modify how this curve looks, you can actually make this the slope here. You can make it less and more steep based on dividing this value of x by some number. So for me, I realized that a over 11 was a good value. x minus 0.58 divided by a over 11. 
So you see how the function looks exactly the same, but with a few minor modifications. Again, x goes from 0 to a, and y goes from 0 to d, as you can see here. And then you flip it. So you have to flip this along a 90 degree angle because you want the curve to look like this in our trajectory. So you simply replace x with y and then y with x. And you just multiply it by minus 1 and add a to it. So when you get the points here, y and x, you will have to do this operation to rotate the curve 90 degrees. Okay, so with that being said, we can actually do a quick example. I did this in Excel. So I have x, y here. You have the default curve, which looks like this. So it looks something like that. Okay. And then I, sw I flipped x and y. So I put y where x was and then I put x where y was, but I multiplied it by negative 1 and added 700. So in this case, my value was 700, the entire height. So it'll become like this now. So you see how the curve is flipped over? Let's draw it better here, yeah. So it's flipped a little over its height and then now it looks proper. So we have x this way and then y this way here. So with this being said, we can move on to the application itself to design and develop the trajectory curve. Okay, we can now move on to the code and the first thing I have is a trajectory class that contains all the design variables along with all the user inputs. So this is the class header file here. I use vector and mat.h because I need to perform array operations along with mathematical evaluations. I have a bunch of variables here and I'll go over them now. The first two are the x and the y points of my trajectory. Next is the height, which is a user input, the downrange, which is calculated from the user inputs by the Haversine formula, the minimum distance, which is the Pythagorean theorem, the actual distance, which is the length of the trajectory itself, the starting and the ending latitude, longitude, along with the starting altitude, the bearing, so what the heading is from the start to the goal, the line of sight angle, the radius of the earth, which is needed for the Haversine formula. I have a value called tangent factor. Now this value is an input, but you can actually keep it constant because it tells you how the tangency will be. If it is a higher value, it'll be more tangent, but if it is lower, it'll be less tangent. So if you remember in the presentation, I picked 11. I divided the value by 11 to make it a little bit more tangent, but we can experiment with this value and see how it changes along with the different um, inputs. So I'll show you that, that after. We have the simulation time and the number of points. I have four methods which I defined. The first one is the constructor where you initialize the constants. Now every time in C++, C++ if you have constant variables, you must use a member initialization list to define them. So like this here, you cannot define it inside because that will break the rules. To evaluate the sigmoid, I just use the same formula, one divided by one plus e minus x minus 0.5 times height. And then I divided by the tangent factor. So in the presentation, it was set to 11, but here I've made it 13 for the time being. You can also use 11 if you want to. But it's good to have different values to see what different shapes you get. Okay. I then return the value by multiplying it by the downrange to scale it up. I then calculate my trajectory by calling this evaluate sigmoid here. So I just pretty much use step sizes of 50. So every 50 meters, I calculate the height. Now you can use every one, one meter if you want, but you will have a number of points. If you use one meter or less value, you will end up with a lot more points. However, 50 is a good number here. If you use 100, you will end up with half the points. So you can change this according to what you want. I also have a check here which says that if I don't reach the end of my trajectory based on how, if it is evenly divisible by 50 or not, I will append the last value here. It's good to have as a check there. 
Now, every time I calculate my trajectory points, I also find the distance between each point because I want to find out how long my trajectory will be. So I need to actually get the distance between the two points and then keep adding it up until you reach the end of the trajectory. So I'm doing it by just square root value here. It'll be delta x squared plus delta y squared and then just square root that. Okay. Lastly, I get the number of points in my trajectory by just getting the size of this vector. So in C++, vectors are dynamic arrays, which means that you can append as you go along by doing the pushback operation here. At the end, I just get the size of my vector. So how many elements are inside of it? I have one more method here, which resets the trajectory. So since I want to use this in an application, I want to make it easy to reset so I can recalculate things. And that does it here. It just resets everything to their default values. And here is where I use the Haversine formula to check if the line of sight angle is more than 60 degrees. If it is less, I will return false and I will prompt the user to recalculate things here. So I have my phi 1, phi 2. I'm pretty much using the exact same formula from that web website. Okay, so I'm just getting my downrange, the line of sight angle by doing a tan, the bearing and the minimum distance. And if it is less, I return false. If not, I just return true. That is pretty much the trajectory class. We can now move on to the UI layout and how I integrate this class into my front end. This here is the UI layout. I have a queue custom plot frame here. I also have two buttons to generate and reset the trajectory. I have my user inputs here. When I click generate, I can also view my trajectory information here. So now let's see how this is set up. Going into main window.h, I have included my queue custom plot, my trajectory, and then queue pix map. Now this is not needed, but I just put it there just in case. I have a few methods here, plot the points, which will go into queue custom plot, on push button and then on reset button clicked, and my trajectory class. I create an instance of my class, right? Because I need to use it. So when I initialize my UI, I have default values here. Instead of typing in every time, it's good to have default values in UI design. It makes it easier for the user to just quickly test it and see if the program works as intended. When I push the button to generate trajectory, I store all my values and then I check if it is feasible. If it is, I will calculate it and then plot it by using the queue custom plot functionalities and then enable my reset button. If it is not feasible, I will give a prompt to the user and then I will not do any more calculations. The user has to put new values in to get it to work. Okay, so with that said, now we can plot the points when we have determined the trajectory. So I just plot it into X and Y. I, I create a new graph, set the line style, scatter style, set data, and then set the labels. Lastly, I set the range of my X, Y axis to see the plot correctly in the, on the window. And I enable it such that it can be dragged and zoomed in by doing set interactions. When I click my reset button, what's going to happen is that all the values will reset by calling the reset trajectory method. And then the fields will also reset. I also plot an empty trajectory so the graph gets clear too. Let's see how this works in real time. I'm going to press play here. Now you may get this one error which says that the Q custom plot is not included, but if you get that, just put a SRC in front of it. But now we didn't get it, so that's good. Anyway, so let's plot this and see what we get. If I put generate, these are my default values here. You see how they're already loaded in the inputs. You see how it looks like here now. So we see the number of points, the line of sight angle is about 66 degrees, which is quite good. So that, that'll be this angle here. 
If I draw a straight line, I'll get that. My downrange D here is 15147. The bearing is 39.5 degrees, so it's pointing a little bit north. The true distance is 41 kilometers. So the length of this line is essentially 41 kilometers. The minimum distance is the Pythagorean, so it'll be just this value squared plus this squared and then I square root it. So that'll be 38596, it's a bit lesser, of course. And I have about 700 points. If I press reset, it'll go away. And then I can also regenerate it. Let's try using a different tangent factor. As I said before, my tangent factor was set to 13. Let's make it like 9. And then let's see what we get. You see how it is not very tangent now? You see how like it is still sloping. It's not fully vertical at the start and the finish. Now, when you want rockets to land, you want them to land vertically. So you want this to be more tangent. This is not very good. If I make it like, let's say like five, for example, and if I regenerate it, you see how it's going off course now. It's not very clean. You need more points to actually get a tangent point. So let's make it 15. Let's increase it. You see how it's a lot more tangent now, but there is a uh, caveat where when you make it tangent, you will also decrease the slope. You don't want the slope to be too flat because then you, you will have the rocket going sideways, which is not practical. You want it to be always descending at some point. So show you're balancing it, right? Like you're balancing the tangent versus the slope of this line. If I make it like, let's say 12, you see how it becomes less tangent, but then the slope will increase too. So I think 12 is a good value. It is reasonably vertical at the finish here, at the start, sorry. So it is quite vertical at the start and at the finish, if I zoom in, it is more or less a vertical descent. So that's good. In my opinion, a value between 11 and 14 is quite reasonable. So that is pretty much how you can fine tune that. So that is pretty much our application. You, you can try using different inputs and see what you get. I hope you're able to get it to work. And it should work on Windows too. You just have to rebuild the project because on Mac OS, it has its own build. And on Windows, it'll use a different C++ compiler to build it. So th thank you for watching. If you are interested in robotics and motion planning, then be sure to check out my courses on Udemy on path planning algorithms for holonomic and non-holonomic autonomous vehicles by using sampling-based methods.